Hello, welcome to today's lecture. And for today, we'll be looking at the last section of our model two. And today we'll be discussing the psychology of the patient. My name is Farm Mark Bequin, a lecturer from Flexion Health College. Now for today's lecture, these are the main sections we'll be concentrating on. We'll be looking at the psyche of the ill person. We'll talk about the stages of the illness experience. We'll talk about grieving. We talk about mourning and bereavement, and the last one will be stages of grieving. Okay, and it's important that we understand all these sections. Psychology is a scientific study of the mind and behavior, according to the American Psychological Association. Psyche is a term used for the human soul, mind, or spirit. The more positive at the attitude towards the illness, the better the patient's mental and physical health. And if he, that, that's a, going to be the whole uh, foundation to, to this lecture on the psyche of the ill, okay, before we start the grieving. If a patient's attitude towards their illness is negative, it's difficult for them to recover and sometimes it's even worsens. But if a patient has gotten a positive attitude towards their illness, they recover faster, they are more healthier, and normally issues that, for example, we, 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 we need not to give medicines, this patient not, uh, normally will understand, all right? So that's a positive. For example, a patient going to the hospital and a doctor thinks that, okay, you're okay. All that you need is bed rest. Rest for some time and you'll be okay. A patient with a positive attitude would accept that doctor's instruction and come home and drink water and rest. But a patient with a negative attitude towards health will say that the doctor did not give him or her any medicines. And you'll come back to your pharmacy to say that I went to the hospital with a particular condition. The doctor did not give me any medicines. And they will insist we give them medicine because their attitude towards healthcare is negative. There are three main behaviors that normally are exhibited, okay? And we can have one person exhibiting all these behaviors we'll be talking about. The first is the health behavior. The second is the illness behavior. And the third is the sick rule behavior. Now, when you look at the health behavior, is any behavior, okay, that the person shows, okay? So, is any activity undertaken by a person believing himself to be healthy for the purpose of preventing disease or detecting it in an asymptomatic stage? So, basically, we say that when somebody considers themselves healthy, there are lots of activities they will do to prevent having a disease or for them to detect the disease early before they show symptoms okay that's the meaning of asymptomatic okay they are not showing any symptoms of the disease all right but they have detected the disease before so let's say somebody is diabetic they are not passing urine the nothing shows but because they are in a health behavior they will normally be going for routine medical checkups and it can be spotted oh you are having uh, your blood sugar that is going up or your heart your blood pressure is going up so take steps so that you don't become hypertensive okay so the the they take steps to detect diseases even at the asymptomatic stage or before the disease shows symptoms and that is what we call the health behavior for a patient to be in the health behavior there's a what's called a model the way they they they, they think and let's look at them on our extreme left we see demographic variables and psychological characteristics these are called modifiable or these are things we can change okay your class class talk about status in society your gender okay your age your your schooling everything has to do with demographics okay for example as we grow there are some diseases that we may have okay so we can decide that based on the demographic somebody knowing that i am growing so there could be what we call a perceived susceptibility which means that if i am growing it's possible i become hypertensive and because of that i'll take an action so we can go from demographic variables as age okay if you are aging i'll perceive I foresee in the future that I may get hypertension. So that's the perceived susceptibility. Based on that, the patient will take an action. That is, let me go for jogging. Let me reduce my salt intake. Let me uh, not be stressing myself. Let me sleep well. Also, 
there could be a gender like ladies may have problem with menopause or they may have problem with weak bones we call it osteoporosis or men may have problem with their prostates okay uh, uh, and you could have the uh, prostate cancer all these things are perceived susceptibility that as i'm a man i may go through this one we could also have psychological characteristics like personality some people by nature are more outgoing than others okay those that are outgoing normally are not very stressed and do that are introverts and they are always indoors peer pressure and all those things can affect psychologically the way we view our health all right so both demographic variables and psychological the way we think okay characteristics can affect how we perceive how we are exposed or how we are going to get a disease that's so called perceived susceptibility or it can affect perceived severity if i get diabetes they are going to amputate my legs they are going to cut off my leg okay or as we are ladies some of you may have perceived if i'm, I'm if i'm going to give birth i may have complications they have to do a cesarean okay because of that let me exercise so that i'm healthy okay so we are encouraging pregnant women to exercise so that we are looking at perceived severity normally when you exercise very well and you are giving birth it is proven that it's easier than you are not exercising that's called perceived severity there could also be other health motivation in fact it is it is good it feels good for you to be healthy all right so based on that it can motivate people to say that i want to be in shape i want to be able to be active i want to be able to do all these things okay i want to grow to be 60 70 80 years and i'm so young and healthy okay so the health motivation can move you to take an action that is becoming uh, uh, effective we also look at perceived benefits okay so perceived benefits of being healthy for example if i play tennis i play tennis if i play tennis the perceived benefits are also always making me feel healthy it reduces my cost on medicines my weight is being checked i'm always happier and i look younger okay so the perceived benefits of 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 of, of being healthy is pushing me to take an action that is i am playing in tennis and the last one is perceived barriers Perceived barriers normally we look at if somebody is looking at um, getting healthy. Barriers could be, will I be taking medicines my whole life? Okay, every day I'll be taking medicine, or the cost of treatment when I get sick, or I may lose my work when I get sick. Those perceived barriers to health will push me to take an action that then I have to exercise now so that I don't get a disease like diabetes and they're going to put me on medicines for the whole of my life. All right. I will not, I'm not going to smoke because if I look at the perceived barriers, when I smoke, I may have a lung disease and it can lead me to get cancer. All right. So all these things, both the demographic variables and the psychological variables can affect the perceived susceptibility. Okay. Uh, how you see yourself to get a disease or perceived severity or health motivation or perceived benefits. All right. To take an action. Now, when you come to the on the right side, you can see there's something that we call cues to action. Cues to action is there are some things that may push us to also move into the health behavior model. For example, advertisements on television, okay, announcements on television, programs that are being run, stay healthy, like the Ghana Health Service is doing a lot of programs about hand washing, okay. The one we call Rosa Fasamina, yes, and yeah, all those cues to action. The, the COVID-19 that we are having is pushing us. You see stickers everywhere. The radio is talking about it. The banks are talking about it. Schools are doing social distance. So these are cues that will push you to take an action, all right? So for somebody to be healthy, this is how the person normally thinks. He looks at his demographics, his class, his gender, his age, his educational background. All these things affect whether they will be healthy or not. So let's look at these two people. Now, there's a young, handsome guy that wants to uh, get this attractive lady, all right? You see that of a certain life. And you can see the young man standing. And this is how the young man, the young man is using perceived susceptibility. 
and what he's saying that oh me i am safe i only have a clean partners i don't have hiv is okay that's how he's thinking because of that he wants to go in for a lady because he's not having gonorrhea he's not having hiv is he's not having syphilis so he's looking at perceived susceptibility that he's not susceptible he's seeing this lady standing in front of her as clean lady so if i have any sexual intercourse with her i am not going to have any disease so he wants to go ahead and propose to this girl and possibly take her to bed to have a sexual intercourse now let's go ahead with this lady's twisting and now these two are in a health behavior the lady is having what you call perceived severity what she's thinking is that if i'm not careful and i get an an sti is really going to affect me okay so it is better for me to say no to this guy because if i accept him and he gives me gonorrhea or syphilis it may affect me i can't live with it so you see the lady is looking at the perceived severity of getting an std like gonorrhea or AIDS, okay or syphilis and based on that this lady will say no because she wants to be healthy now this guy too thinks he's healthy he's looking at the lady that lady is rather healthy so she's he is not susceptible he's not prone to getting hiv AIDS or gonorrhea or syphilis because this lady is healthy all right so perceived susceptibility and perceived severity can affect people in different ways in a pharmacy somebody always come and buy lydia okay contraceptive personal too because they don't want to get pregnant they are looking at the perceived susceptibility somebody to come to the pharmacy and they want to do absolute abstinence they are looking at the perceived severity all right now let's talk about the illness behavior illness behavior refers to the way in which symptoms are perceived evaluated and acted upon by a person who recognizes some pain discomfort or other signs of organic malfunction now it is it is big english basically now what we are just saying is simple if somebody perceives perceive means that they feel they think that there's something wrong with them like the young man you can see feels that there's a pain in his truth okay recognizes that pain and discomfort okay that is what we classify as a illness because they are going to act on on the surface it may seem that the nature and the severity of the illness would be the sole determinant of an individual's response and for very severe illness this is often true so assuming we wake up you wake up in the morning and you can't swallow you are trying to swallow and it's causing a lot of pain a lot of us will act some of us will go and go for warm salty water gargle and so i think that yesterday i i over uh, sunk or something i jubilated and i shouted that's why my truth is hurting all right so just warm water will be okay somebody to have a different behavior oh am i getting throat cancer oh god i think i'm dying all right so you see these two people having a sore truth may have different perceptions about what the sore throat is but many people fail to see as a physician or some go very late in the disease process despite the presence of serious symptoms and many other people see physicians routinely for trivial or very minor ailments so these are extremes there are some of us that when we are not well and we are not sick we are we are sick we may say oh, ebeko, ebeko, this is nothing i'll be well and this this can be serious and by the time we report to the hospital to see a medical doctor it's already late there are also other people too that the little discomfort they have do rush the hospital to so the doctor doctor what's the problem i think i have a pain a sensation on my teeth okay so i want you to share the doctor so i don't think there's anything wrong with you the following morning they are going again doctor what i am coughing i think i've gotten covid 19 and meanwhile they don't even have any covid 19 okay if they have a small pimples they'll go there all right so this person is extremely sensitive to their health when they are not well okay and there could be other people that really they are more of careless okay they have a careless behavior now this pattern suggests that illness behavior is influenced by social and cultural factors in addition to okay and sometimes instead of psychological conditions so there are some of us that where we come from forgive me to say this okay we don't have much money okay sometimes our parents cannot afford to be taken out for checkups and i'm sure a lot of us okay myself included okay i go for checkups once a while okay, i see that my dentist but i have to go and check my eye i have not done it for over how many years now and sometimes because of my busy schedules okay so these things might have affected my illness behavior 
some people too they have a family doctor that every three months they come for a checkup all right so sometimes saying some of these things is is difficult because patients may come with various reasons either social or cultural or sometimes even psychological okay some people are christian they say that once i'm a christian god is my healer so even if i feel these symptoms god has healed me and this could be a serious condition that the person might have benefited from an early medical intervention now let's look at as such man's five stages of illness behavior all right and after this i'm going to go through into details with you the first one starts when the patient experiences a symptom so it's called a symptom experience okay when the patient has uh, experienced the symptoms so there are some patients that will ignore the symptom when they ignore the symptoms they, they don't come to this uh, the second stage is the assumption of the sick rule but those who take the symptoms seriously will come to assumption rule okay of the sick rule and that one means that once they feel they have a pain in their truth the next thing that they want to do is to find out what is wrong with me what can i do to get well then if they are they are not able to go out of the assumption rule they come to the third stage of the illness stage and that is the medical care contact where they are going to the hospital to see a doctor or they decide to do self-care they come to our pharmacies they want to come and buy strep cells or or tom tom or ahomeka ginger or they want to buy a medicine for their soul truth basically and that's what we call the medical care contact after that one they may come to what called a dependent patient rule and the dependent patient rule depends if the disease is acute acute means that for a short period of time that's to go normally they recover faster okay but it's chronic let's say hypertension diabetes normally it is difficult and they will have to come to the last stage that is recovery and rehabilitation now when you look at the symptom experience which is the first stage of the illness experience the illness experience is initiated when an individual first senses that there is a wrong perception of pain discomfort or general unease or some disruption okay in their body their body is not functioning well that's the first time okay so once the patient experience this one that ah, i think there's something wrong they are in the first stage of the illness behavior and that's called the symptom experience then they'll come to the second stage and the second stage is they will assume the sick rule if the individual accepts that the symptoms are a sign of an illness the coughing could be an illness oh i've seen blood in my panties then it's an illness oh i saw uh, a blood in my stool it's an illness oh when i when i woke up i've been urinating the whole day it's, it's an illness okay if the individual accepts that the symptoms are a sign of an illness and are sufficiently worrisome okay they, they are worried about it they can't have their peace of mind they think there's something wrong then the transition is made to the sick row all right so they have moved from the um, uh, the experience to the sick row now at which time the individual begins to relinquish some or all normal social rules so for example if this person is a wife or a husband and she's supposed to cook and she has seen blood in her panties she's crying she thinks it could be cervical cancer if she's pregnant she's worried it could be a miscarriage and the normal rules that's social rules she's supposed to cook for the family she's supposed to sweep the house she will relinquish or she stop doing all those things because she has assumed that she is sick then we have the third stage which is the medical care contact and as i've said earlier it is described as the point at which an individual sought professional medical care all right so now once they have assumed the sick rule what you see that no then i have to go to the hospital i have to go to the pharmacy today medical sociologists are much more aware or the variety of options available to persons who have entered the sick row behavior the increasingly common practice of self-care okay and the importance of the individual social and cultural environment in shaping the action most of us will go to google okay and once we, we are we will go to google we want to google our symptoms and find out what is wrong with that what are the medicines we want to take some people will go to the chemical shop some will come to the pharmacies, some will take herbal medicines. All right, you know, what they are doing is that they want to get well. Okay, and that is called the medical care contact. Then they will move to the fourth stage, that is called the dependent patient rule. Now, with the onset of the dependent patient rule, the patient is expected to make every effort to get well. 
Now, some people, of course, enjoy the benefits of this rule. Example, hmm, there's increased attention and they don't go to work. There's escape. Okay, if, if you have been sick and your mom is around, they, they will pamper you. Oh, sweet, that's what will you eat? Do you want some light soup? Should I pamper food for you? Will you eat kinky? All right, so that normally is the what we call the dependent patient rule, where most often they're not. All right, so during this dependent rules the patient normally enjoys this attention and sometimes you have an excuse duty you don't even go to work and an attempt to malinga okay is there all right and most often than not a lot of patients will stay in the dependent patient rule people will cook for you they'll wash they wash your dresses for you they'll clean your bedroom for you basically if you want water you call please i want water your mom will be serving you all right even at work you have somebody escorting you home all right, so that's what we call the dependent. This is where the patient will depend on other people for the normal chores or normal things that they will be doing. Now, eventually, however, the acute patient will either get well, okay, acute patient, like, assuming the patient is having malaria, it's an acute condition. With malaria, within a week, you are fine. Or this patient have gotten some menstrual pain, they will be fine. Or this patient has gotten some diarrhea, they'll be fine within a few days, okay. So that's acute patient will get well, and move to stage five, which is rehabilitation and recovery, or do terminate the treatment and perhaps seek alternative treatment. Okay, so normally it is important that during the dependent patient rule, these are the time that the patient will depend on other people for ordinary functions that they used to do. Then, after this rule, we move to what we call the stage number four, and during this dependent rule. The following list identifies the major concerns people have during this stage. For one, impairment of the personal cognitive function. There are some diseases that, when I talk about your cognitive functions, about memory, there are some diseases called dementia. Some could be psychological diseases, some could be mental diseases that you tend to forget your name, you can't sign your own check, you forget the password to your phone, the password to your ATM card, and that is a problem. It's scary to think about this, that I'll be sick that my mobile money, my mumu, I even forget my password. You lose your personal independence. Okay, people will be bathing you in bed. Okay, they'll be washing your underwears. Okay, they'll be seeing your nakedness. When you go, they'll be administering drugs to you. So you lose your personal independence. There's changes in your body image. The ladies, you're not doing your hair. Your makeup is gone. Okay, your hair is overgrown. Your, 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 your body image, the way you see yourself, sometimes at the end of the disease process, you have reduced weight drastically or sometimes you put on too much weight. Then there's withdrawal from key social functions. If you're an usher at church, you cannot do ushering again. If you're a pastor at church, you can't preach again. If you are an MCA, you can't go to the pharmacy because you are sick like the COVID. You say when you are sick, stay home. All right, no matter what you have, we ask you to stay home. So this dependent patient rule will withdraw the patient from key social functions and that could really worry them. And also there's a concern about their future. If I stay home too much, won't I lose my work? Okay, my boss will replace me. If I stay home too much, by the time I go, the church would have might have found another pastor or another usher. Okay, if if I am sick and I'm not I'm not supposed to uh, engage in social functions, I can't have intimacy with my husband or my wife. I can't ha have sex and all those things. Won't my husband or my 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 wife look for another sexual partner? So there's fear about their future when they come to the dependent patient role. And we are supposed to understand this these various stages because we are going to have patients coming to our pharmacy, and we will need to reassure them. In fact, a lot of patients with diabetes and hypertension don't want to take their medicines because of the fear of the future that if i take my medicines if I'm, he's a man he's going to have what's called erectile dysfunctioning he cannot have his normal sexual life because of that a lot of men don't take their anti hypertensive drugs all right so as an mca because you are aware that this patient may be in this room we even tell them a, a full time we tell them before they even start their medications okay so that they comply with the medicines we are given when it comes to the last stage of the illness behavior, which is recovery and rehabilitation, okay, for patients with acute 
diseases okay like malaria is acute a short period they are fine or typhoid fever a short period they are fine the process is one of relinquishing the sick rule and moving back to a normal rule obligations okay once you are down with malaria and you are fine you go back to work once you are done with malaria and you are fine, if you are a wife, you start cooking and sleeping and doing all those things, all right? So for acute patients, once they relinquish, once they move from the sick rule, they are going straight to their normal rule obligations. However, for chronic patients, and I'm talking about patients with diabetes, patients with cancer, patients with hypertension, patients with asthma, patients with diseases that we cannot treat, but they will manage it for the rest of their life. For such chronic patients, the extent to which prior rule obligations may be resumed ranges from those who forsake the sick rule to those who will never be able to live it. Okay, there are, there are some people that do forever, like cancer in treatment, they are forever weak, so they are not going back to their normal rule obligations. There are some times too that some of them are lucky enough that they are hypertensive, they can still go to work, but the normal pressure they face, we ask them to reduce it, all right? So each stage involves a major decision that must be made by the individual that determine whether the sequence of stages will continue or the process will be discontinued, all right? So we, if you have looked at these behaviors, it is important for us to understand that when somebody comes to a pharmacy and comes to the complaint, please, let's not rush. Sometimes we check somebody's blood pressure. Immediately you check the blood pressure. I say, oh, madam, you have hypertension. Oh, sir, you have diabetes. Please, once you pronounce them, you, you take them through a whole psychological problem. All right? And that's why I say, normally these things, leave it for the pharmacist. All of you are going to work under a qualified, registered pharmacist, okay, who will be able to take the patient through so that we don't put unnecessary stress on our patients. And the last type of behavior is called the sick rule behavior. And the sick role behavior is the activity undertaken for the purpose of getting well by those who consider themselves ill, whether it is acute or chronic, all right? Once we are sick, all of us, every normal human being would want to get well. Now, when people consider themselves to be sick, they adapt the so-called sick role behavior, which includes the following components. One, the patient that is sick is not to be blamed for being sick and this is debatable by the way for example if somebody gets cancer you cannot blame the patient for getting cancer if somebody gets ectopic pregnancy you cannot blame the patient why did you get ectopic pregnancy if a man gets prostate cancer we cannot blame the man that why did you get prostate cancer if somebody gets asthma we cannot blame them to say why did you get asthma some of us we do that we tell our friends oh you like being sick too much we tell it some of us have heard it from families some of us have heard it from parents and children or girlfriends and husband when your wife is sick you are annoyed you have asked for you every day you are sick ask for you every day you are sick please the patient is not to be blamed for being sick it makes their management very difficult however let me be quick to add there are some times that even though we are not blaming the patient, we should advise. For example, if this patient is an alcoholic and smokes a lot, and because of that, they are always sick, we tell them that, boss, say, it's because you smoke a lot. It's because you take a lot of alcohol. That is why you are always sick. All right? So if you can stop it, you are going to be better. Here, we are not directly blaming the patient for, but the patient is responsible for their health. They are supposed to stop some of their bad habits, okay, and have a healthy living style so that the type of illness that they are having would go away so the patient is not supposed to be blamed for being sick we are not however if the type of condition they are having is lifestyle related okay they are stressing they don't sleep they drink a lot of alcohol they are taking energy drinks and because of that they are having hypertension or diabetes we, we correct them all right we don't blame them two the patient is exempted from work and other responsibilities anytime somebody is sick we don't ask them to go to work. They are supposed to stay home so that they, they can recover and recuperate in a lovely manner, all right? Once the patient is sick and they are working, they will never get well. I normally say that even animals, if you have a fowl or a dog or a, a sheep in your house and that animal is sick, they are always in their pen. They don't come out, okay, because they have to rest and recover. How much more human beings? So when somebody comes to a pharmacy and they are sick, we tell them to take some days off if they are they are their own bosses sells tomatoes at the market it's a taxi driver a truck driver drives okada 
or a uber driver tell them to stay home because when they stay for about a few days sometimes three days they are better so one of the components of the sick row behavior is that any patient that is in the sick row behavior should be exempted from work and other responsibilities so that they can heal faster okay the third one is that the illness is seen as long as the patient has said the undesirability of it so far as the patient says that if i swallow i feel pain in my throat we cannot say that oh we have given you a mouthwash we, we have given you a lozenge strep cells why is that after taking all this medicine you still say you are sick all right if the patients say that they are not well they are not well we can't challenge them on that and i'm sure that's why a lot of times when a doctor is going on a ward rounds and they they, they they see their patients on the bed they ask the madam say boss how are you feeling today the patient can say, oh, doctor, I need the moon in your crowd. Today, dear, I'm not well. The doctor will believe him because the patient is already in the sick row behavior. The first one is the patient is expected to seek competent help to get well again and will do anything to get well again. This is their responsibility. This is their duty. The patient should seek help. All right. Anytime a patient, they are supposed to, and normally some can go to the stream, by the way, by taking all type of concoctions and practicing all type of thing because they're having diabetes and they believe they can cure themselves and they do a lot of things that can damage their health. All right. That's why we say they should seek competent help. They should go to a hospital, get a qualified medical doctor to view their condition and give them appropriate medicines. Now, obligations under the sick road theory. People who are sick are exempted to uh, are expected to get well. That is the obligation. In fact, if you work with me and you are sick, and I ask you to go and stay home and rest and get better, but you decide not to, you are watching TV later at night, you are drinking alcohol, you are smoking. Okay, for if you are working with me, I'll let you go. I ask you to resign. Why? Because I'm expecting you to get well and get better. All right. They are supposed to work on getting better by going to the doctor. And complying with medication regimens, medicines they are giving you are supposed to take your medicines, foods they have asked you not to take or to take, you do that. If they ask you to rest, giving you bed rest for three days, I'm expecting to see you sleeping. However, if I see you at Katamato Makola and you have been given an excuse this for three days and you are shopping because you are sick, for me, I'm not going to take it lightly. All right, so the sick should work on getting better by doing what you have been asked him to. Have been asked of him or her to do and the last one is to, they are supposed to cooperate with treatment plans okay whatever plans that we have given you that follow so that you get well the sick is supposed to know please when the people come to our pharmacy when our patient comes to our pharmacy let's take time to educate them on some of these things okay their healing is their hands it's not in their hands we just will administer the medications and give them counseling but if the patient is going to feel better it is their decision all right an understanding of a patient's illness perception is necessary to help in a diagnosis. When somebody comes to a pharmacy, understanding how they perceive their illness is very important in helping us to know what is wrong with them. Some people think that their condition they are having is caused by witches and wizards. Some people think that it's a case, okay, it will be a bonidia. Some people think that it's because of some food they ate. Some people think that it's because of some water they drank. Some people think that because of their stress in their relationship, their boyfriend is stressing her or him, or their girlfriend is stressing him. All right. So for us as healthcare professionals, especially as an MC, you'll be managing some common conditions in the pharmacy. Before a patient's diagnosis is made, it's important to understand how they perceive their condition they are having. Okay. This can be difficult because perception is highly subjective, by the way. And there is no absolute method of measuring it either from the individual to individual or even within one individual's perception throughout time. All right. So sometimes it's difficult because the perception they are having could be true or may not be true. Researchers have determined that reducing illness perception to its most basic elements can help patients to describe what it, it is that they are feeling about their illness all right so here when a patient come we want them to be as big sometimes you say that i think it's a witch or i think somebody have cursed me or boom dear sometimes just ask them that madam do you think that somebody can curse you with malaria all right once you start to ask the day that can reduce the oh then i think that it's mosquitoes where i live there are a lot of mosquitoes i'm sure that i might have been bitten by one of them and they might have transmitted the condition to me now, patient with the illness perception, 
that a sickness is or will become temporarily are more successful and this one is attitude if a patient believes that oh this condition i'm having this type of disease i'm having is temporary it's going to go away in a few days it's going to go away in a few months i believe it that i'm going to be fine Patients that have gotten that attitude and perception normally are more successful with treatments. Even if they are diabetics and they are taking their medicine, saying that I know that if I take my medicines, I'm going to be well, it is temporary. They are more successful in their treatments. They look more healthier, they improve even under pressure, and they endure stress better. They always come to the hospital and take their medicines. But they endure it. We don't see their life deteriorating. And also they live it longer all right so it is important that our perception that when there's disease and the patient think that i believe this disease will go i work on it it is temporary the patient normally we call it a prognosis okay the outcome of our treatment is better all right however patients whose illness is perceived as negative okay they, they think they think that nothing can be done. Oh, I'm going to die. This is easier. It killed my auntie. It killed my friend. Whatever uh, 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 they, they think and believe. Negative will affect the quality of life. And are more likely to become discouraged or depressed than those who don't have this particular perception. All right. So you see, the way a patient perceives a disease is important. For us, so it's not just giving the medicine when you are selling in your pharmacies that you are going to be working very soon when you leave this school. All right, so when a patient walks inside my pharmacy and this patient is diabetic, is having diabetes, and they come to buy their diabetes medicine or they are having hypertension, they come to buy their anti hypertensive medicines, I'll work on their mind. I'll have some time to talk with them because the way they are perceiving their hypertension will eat, either mean they are getting well or they'll be getting worse and they may go and have a stroke. So basically on the sick rule behavior as MCAs, before we come to our next topic, that is grieving. Okay, basically what we have said in a nutshell is that let's understand the sick rule behavior, the health behavior and the illness behavior that people go through that their mind is powerful in healing. The way they behave, the way they perceive is important to their healing process. Now, let's add on the last part of our lecture, then we'll be finished with today's lecture, and that is grieving. The role of the pharmaceutical care team, and when you talk about the pharmaceutical care team, we are talking about the pharmacist, the pharmacy technicians, and you, the medicine counter assistants, okay, in helping to guide the patient and his family through the grief and bereavement process of death is, is going to be described in this lecture, okay? Now, the pharmaceutical care team's role is one of understanding, tolerance, and empathy for the dying patient and his family. I've, I've come across patients that are dying. They have few days to go, and they are grieving, they are sad. They have had patients and family that have lost their close ones, and as a pharmacist, what I can do best is to understand them, tolerate them in a particular way. When they come to the pharmacy and they bring the prescription, they are crying. You ask them questions, they can't even answer. Please let's be understanding, especially those of us that will be working in the hospital. We have a lot of patients that will come and they have been bereaved, okay, and they are crying. Let's show empathy, feel for them, console them. Let's have a heart for humans. A lot of patients have described us as heartless people. Because when we leave this school and we start to work, we seem not to have any emotions and care for human life again. Please, this school doesn't want to train people like that. We want to train MCs that you are qualified, you are you are competent, and two, you have a heart for humans. All right. So now let's look at what is grieving. Now, grief is normal and it is a process. Okay, expressing grief is how a person reacts to the loss of a loved one. When they lose their loved one, how would they react? Many people think of grief as a single instance or as a short time of pain or sadness in response to a loss, like the tears that is shed at a loved one's funeral. And normally I say that if somebody shares a tear, if you see somebody grieving because they've lost a loved one, if you look at the tear, the tear is just salty water that is coming from the eye. The water is just 1% of it. But the emotions that the person is expressing is 99%. So when you see somebody crying and we see their tears coming, 
what we don't see is 99% the hurts and the pain that they are going through. All right. So grieving is where there is an entire emotional process of coping with the loss. How do I cope with this person? How do I cope losing my 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 father? How do I cope losing my mom? How do I cope losing my son, my daughter, my pastor, my best friend? Okay, that's emotional process of coping the loss. And it can last for a long time. Some people can grieve their whole life. I have a sad story about a couple I knew. The husband died. And, and the wife died in two weeks' time because the wife was grieving seriously. And that was what we call complicated grief. Then she died too. All right? So people can grieve for a long time if what they lost is, is, great of, is of great value to them. Now, the process of grieving involves many different emotions and actions and expressions, okay, and all of which help a person come to terms with the loss of a loved one. We may hear that the time of grief being described as normal grieving, but this simply refers to a process anyone may go through, and none of us experience grief the same way. This is because Grief doesn't look or feel the same way for everyone. And every loss is different. All right, so people may not even share a tear. You may not see them shedding tears, but they may be grieving deeply, especially men. They may stay in their room. We don't see them grieve, but they grieve. Some is in, unless, of course, sometimes when they are mourning, in, you know, in the funeral, okay, later I'm talking about mourning and grieving. Mourning is the public show of grief. Okay, that's where we see them at here. But a lot of people may grieve, especially when they have lost something great. All right. So mourning often goes along with grief, as I've said. Now, while grief is personal experience, all right, we stay in our room, it's personal. You cry alone. Sometimes you're in a shower, you are bathing, you are crying. You, are, you, are, you wake up in the morning at midnight, you wake up and you are crying. That is grieving. Mourning, okay, is how grief and loss is shown in public. Okay, as you can see, the ladies cry in public, and 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 we have seen this a lot when they go to funerals and they will cry. And those of us that forgive me if I I, I use P because I'm an Akan, okay, and they are wailing and shouting, Adia to Mew, Asema to Mew, Radio Binji Mew. That is what we call mourning. Mourning is how grief and loss is shown in public. All right, so grief is personal, mourning is public. Mourning may involve religious beliefs, okay? There are some things that they, they are there. Of course, look at, she's wearing black because when you're mourning, you cannot wear white, all right? They don't, the ladies don't wear earrings. You don't wear shoes. You wear black slippers in some, in some, in some other uh, uh, cultures and rituals. You don't pound for food. You don't, you shave your hair. These are all things that people do when they are mourning, okay? And it's important we understand. So when a patient walks into a pharmacy in black, Wearing a black slippers or what we, we call chaliwati, wearing a small black earring, they are not making, they are having any makeups on. Then we know that this person is mourning. It's, it's a sign, a public sign of grief. Okay, and many may be affected by other ethnic backgrounds. And I know there are a lot of religious uh, things that people do and cultural customs that you are supposed to do when you lose your close relatives. Sometimes they don't even allow you to go out. You stay home. Okay, yeah, and you wear black like if you're a widow, you wear black for a whole year, and you can't even marry because you have to mourn your husband for one year. And I believe a lot of our cultures in the Ghana, especially, mourning is extended for one year. It's okay after one year before you remove your black dress, then you can wear an ordinary dress. So you will mourn somebody for a period of time. Now, the rituals of mourning seeing friends and family and preparing for the funeral and the barrier or the final. Fiscal separation often gives some st structure to the grieving process. All right. So sometimes the grieving process, for example, going to the morgue or the mortuary, putting the person in the coffin, it, it gives a structure to the grieving. And normally society will do that one to help the person overcome 
they are grieved. Sometimes there's a same sense of numbness because because you are preparing for the funeral, you are preparing food, you are going to hang canopies, you are arranging chairs. For a brief period of time, you forget about your loss because you are going through a ceremony, okay? So because of the activities, okay, leaving the person feeling as though they are just going through the emotions. And normally it's after these rituals that they start to grieve again, all right? Then we have what we call bereavement. Bereavement is important because bereavement has to do with time. All right, so grieving and mourning happen during a period of time that we call bereavement. So bereavement refers to the time, the time when a person experiences sadness after losing a, period, a, a loved one. Okay, so, so for example, we have grieving, which is personal expression when I lose somebody. We have mourning, which is the expression of grief I show in public. Then we have the bereavement. That is the time that I am mourning, okay, the person. The time I am grieving and mourning is what we call bereavement, okay? So, so far as there is grieving and mourning, there is bereavement, all right? So bereavement has to do with the time. Now, how long does the grieving process last? Now, since each person grieves differently, the length and the intensity of the emotions people go through varies from person to person. Grieving is painful, and it's important that those who have suffered a loss be allowed time they need to express their grief. And this is important. In our culture, we say they men so. So normally, men normally will not be showing it, but it hurts them. If you don't allow the person to grieve, they carry the pain throughout their whole life. So grieving is important. Let's give people time to grieve. Some could be weeks, some could be months, some could be years, some could be their whole life they'll be grieving their loss. All right. So grieving does not have any time period. It depends on the person grieving and other factors that will be involved. All right. So although grief is described in phases or stages, it may feel more like a roller coaster. You see, roller coaster is what we call seashore, up and down. It goes up, it comes down. It goes up and it comes down. And I'll be taking you through a process of the grieving for us to understand more. This can make it hard for the bereaved person to feel any sense of progress because it's like today I'm happy, tomorrow I am sad. Today I'm happy, tomorrow I'm sad. What is wrong with me is this person is grieving, okay? So normally there's no sense of progress in dealing with the loss. But as I've said, it depends on, on, on the type of relationship your patient had with the person that they've lost. There is no question to this there's no answer to this question. How long does the grieving process last? There's no answer. But some of the factors that might affect the intensity and the length of grieving are, one, your relationship with the person who died. If I go to a friend's funeral, okay, if, if a friend of mine uh, happens to lose their relative, their close relative, their father, and they are grieving, I don't grieve this way because that is the person's father. If this same person loses a friend, the way they grieve is different from if they lose their father. So relationship with the person that has died will determine the length of time this person is going to grieve. Two, the circumstances of their death. Sometimes they had an accident. Sometimes they, 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 they were in the house and said, oh, mommy, please, I want to go and pick something from the kitchen. She went to the kitchen and fell and died. Okay, so if the circumstance is so sudden, it's, 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 the grieving takes a longer time. But if this person has been sick in the hospital and has been on, 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 on oxygen for, let's say, six months, seven months, a whole year, we are going to Kolebu every day, every day. They are not getting better. They seem to be getting weak and weak and weak. Then psychologically, we are prepared and we know that, oh, the person is even going to die. All right. So the circumstances of their death will show how long that the person is going to grieve. And that last one is your own life experiences. Sometimes when we are grieving, we connect it to that life experience. This person has helped me in life. This person took care of my education. This person molested me when I was a child. This person betrayed me like the biblical Joseph and his brothers. When Joseph saw his brothers, even though that Joseph 
had not lost anybody that was died. Joseph remembered what the brothers did. So his own life experience made him grieve. The Bible says he cried bitterly. All right. So sometimes our life experiences will affect how long we are going to grieve. Some people may think that their father that is dead did not take them to school. So at the funeral, as people are crying, this person is grieving not because the father is dead, but because they think that the father disappointed him in life. The father is a cause of a suffering in life. And that is why they are grieving. All right. So this person can grieve for their whole life. I know somebody like that who is an elderly person, but they still grieve on their father. Why? Because their father did not take them to school. And that is why they are suffering in life. All right. And that's another form of grieving. Grief can also take an unexpected forms. Difficult relationship with a disease prior to their death can cause unique grieving experience for loved ones. There are some people, as I've said, that because they had difficult relationship with the person that is dead, sometimes they even want to beat the dead person before they bury the person. Some want to burn it because they think that the dead person was an evil man. Okay. In addition, prolonged illness can also cause grief to take an unexpected form. And I think I've talked about that already. People will go through many different emotional states while grieving. And experts have described five stages that are usually experienced by adults during the grieving process. Children to grieve, but children have gotten a, a, a different way they present their grief. All right, children to grieve, all right, but adults grieve differently than children. Let's look at these five stages. And I'm going to use this diagram to explain. So normally there's a normal functioning where the person hasn't lost anyone. They are fine. Then they hear of the loss of their loved ones. And once you hear that, oh, that the person's father is dead, okay, the patient now is in a shock and denial state that it is not true. It can't be. My father is not dead. I attended a friend's funeral recently and he said that, Mark, still, I don't believe my mother is gone. I always think about her. I don't believe. Okay, there's a shock and denial in the first few days and the weeks, okay, the person is shocked. And he's denying it that the person is not dead. Maybe the person has traveled or something, but they don't believe the person is dead. All right. So during the first stage, with their shock and denial, there's avoidance. They want to avoid talking about it. They are confused. There's fear. There's numbness and there's blame. You want to blame that if she didn't eat this food, why did she even go to work? If I didn't ask her of this, she didn't have died. All right. So that's the first stage where there's shock and denial. Then they move to the second stage of anger. And here the, 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 the patient shows frustration because, you see, there are lots of things that person might have done for them. They are not getting. There's anxiety. Anxiety is fear of the future. They are afraid to be in a room alone. Okay. They, they can't stay in the room alone. They, 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 they say they hear voices and all those things. They are easily irritated. Small thing, they are annoyed. Small thing, they are crying. Okay, they sometimes feel embarrassed because if everybody is working with their mom, they can't show their mom. Okay, and there's also shame. All right. Then from anger, they move to depression and detachment. Depression and detachment basically means that for this patient, okay, that has lost their loved ones, for this patient that have lost their loved ones, they would feel that depression and detachment okay there's lack of energy and there's a sense of hopelessness all right they feel that their whole future is gone then they come to the fourth stage which is dialogue and dialogue and bargaining now here they want to reach out to others they now want to talk with people they want to tell their story how they were they were with their father or their mother or their son they want to talk about it Okay, and this is a good stage because they are coming out of the grief and they struggle to find meaning for what has happened. Why did the person die so young? Why did this happen to me? Am I not serving God well? Why should this happen to me? Now this person is now talking. Okay, so they leave the depression stage and they are now dialoguing, which is very good. Then they come to the final stage of the grieving process, which is called acceptance. Here, they have accepted it and they are exploring options. Now, who is going to pay my fees? Okay, let me call my auntie. Who is now going to take care of their children? Let me marry a second wife. Let me marry another man who will take care of me. Okay, so there's now a new plan in place. How do you move ahead? How do you now see their future? And once they have accepted, they will now return to a meaningful life where they are empowered, there's now security, there's now self-esteem, and there's now meaning in life, and they can now move on. However, as I've said, the grieving process is like a roller coaster, seashore, up and down. 
even though this patient might have returned to a, a normal, meaningful life, something can trigger it again and you go back to shock and denial. All right. So this is what we call the grieving cycle. Okay. And it's important that the patient goes through this process. Now, some or all of these things can be seen in a patient that they are grieving. And it's important for us to know. Sometimes the patient may hide it from us. But when you see these signs, know that this person is grieving, especially if you know they've lost their close relative. One, there's social withdrawing. They don't attend weddings. They don't attend birthday parties. They don't come for funerals. All right. There's trouble thinking and concentrating. If you are with them and they are, uh, if the person is working with you, you can see that they are not thinking, they are not concentrating. They become restless and anxious at times. Okay, they are afraid and, and they think that they are not secured in their future. There is loss of appetite and normally they are going to reduce a lot of weight because they are not eating. They will always look sad. They don't look cheerful and enthusiastic and motivated. They always feel depressed. Okay. They also tell you that they, they are dreams of the disease. They dream of, of the dead one or sometimes even they have hallucinations okay visions in broad daylight in which they briefly hear or see the disease and sometimes you call their names out they are not sleeping but they, they see the people around them sometimes the person loses weight i've talked about it obviously because they are not sleeping well they have trouble sleeping and they feel tired every day obviously because they are not eating and sleeping you always be tired and they become preoccupied with death or events surrounding death. Okay, they are always talking about death. They are always singing sad songs. They are always about uh, talking about death and death. Some will say that I wish I would die and go and join my father. I want to die and go and join my mom. Okay, in the least thing that you do, they are always pre preoccupied with death. They want to search for reasons for the loss. Why did my father die to leave me alone? Sometimes with results that make no sense to others, all right? So they are searching, they are reading, they want to find out why did the person die. They dwell on mistakes, real or imagined, that he or she made with the disease. Oh, I think the reason why my father died is that when he sent me to go and buy price tamal for him, assuming I bought the medicine, my father wouldn't have died. I, assuming I cooked that favorite food for my mother, she wouldn't have died. So this person is now dwelling on mistakes. Sometimes they did not even make their mistake. It wasn't their, it wasn't their fault. Okay? The next one is the person always feel guilty for the loss. They think that they could have saved the person. I didn't do much more. I didn't love him more. I, the person wouldn't have died. Also, they, they feel all alone and distanced from others. And there's express, expression or expresses anger or envy. I've seen others with their loved ones, okay? The person have lost their wife and they see other people with their wife, they are envious. And sometimes they even cry. If they lost their child and they see another with their child, they are envious. And sometimes they cry. It is difficult. We are supposed to understand our patient and support them when they are grieving. Now, reaching the acceptance stage and adjusting to the loss does not mean that all the pain is over. And I've talked about that. Grieving for someone who was close to you includes losing the future you expected with that person. And this must also be mourned, okay? The sense of loss can last for decades. For decades. Because the person is going to have a father, doesn't have a mother again. And for decades, they are thinking about the sense of their loss. Now, what is our role? What should we do when a patient is grieving? Now, the pharmaceutical care team's role is of understanding, tolerance, and empathy, as we said earlier. With understanding, tolerance, and empathy for the, for the dying patient and his family, we should counsel them appropriately and support them through the process. Sometimes doctors will prescribe antidepressants if these patients go through what's called complicated grief, where they want to take their life, where they are not doing any other thing, where we think it's affecting them psychologically and mentally. Doctors may prescribe medicine, but most often than not, patients may not need medicines. Counseling may be able to help them where there is a support, where there's a family to support, where there are friends to support, where the church is able to support, where the club or association that they join are all ready to support, all right? Now, when somebody is grieving and they come to their uh, pharmacy, please, these things don't say the worst thing to say to somebody. I'm saying this one so that we avoid it, not that we say it. One, 
don't tell the person at least your mother lived a long life many people die young so take it like that it is not good or you say he is in a better place or she brought this on him herself if she didn't go out she wouldn't have died or there is a reason for everything so as she has died god knows why she has died it doesn't make them feel better or aren't you over him yet your father died a long time ago and you are still crying he has been dead for a while now to so get over or you can have another child still madam and see if your child is dead it's okay wait a minute you can have another child please the person is grieving for that child the person is not grieving because they can't have another child or she was such a good person god wanted her to be with him please don't say that how do you know god wanted a person to be with him or i know how it feels okay i know how it feels or she did what she came here to do and it was her time to go okay or just tell the person be strong without showing any emotion as some, a lot of us go to funeral do oh shedding 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 oh be strong be strong be strong how does the person become strong if you don't go and comfort them however we can do these things brother which is good you tell the person i am sorry for your loss i wish i had the right words just know that i care i don't know how you feel but i am here to help in any way i can you and your loved one will be in my thoughts and prayers my favorite memory of your loved one is maybe he always makes me laugh when he comes to this pharmacy he's always laughing he's jovial he's su he was such a lovely person or i am always just a call a phone call away so if you feel you won't need anybody to talk to if you are down please don't worry call me or give me a hug instead of saying something okay just hug the person or we all need help at times like this and i'm here for you this is a difficult time you're going through and i'm here to support you or i am usually up early or late if you need anything please do call me or saying nothing at all like the biblical job when he lost his children and his entire wealth when his three friends came the bible says that he sat by his side and they did not talk for days they were quiet that's the best we can do but sometimes it's best we don't talk when you are going to console a friend okay don't make the person feel worse don't say nyami ne de man nyami ne je to god have taken it away no you know you know they normally hurt more and they will ask question that then why should god take my mom away let's say it's comforting words to them and things that will bring good memories to them all right so we are bringing our lectures to an end okay and it's important we understand the psychology of the patient okay so we have looked at the psyche of the ill person we've looked at the stages of the illness experience grieving mourning and bereavement and the stages of the grieving process so this brings us to the end of model two and i am posting it on friday please there'll be a discussion and on Monday, uh, let us write a quiz, okay? There'll be a discussion on all the four topics we've done, right from communication, conflict management, customer service, and the psychology of the ill person. Please let me know you're listening to the lecture. And as I've said, on Friday, God willing, we'll do other discussions too. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Bye-bye.